Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for all coming out on a dreary morning. I think most of you have probably come up Plenty Road. I heard Mernda and Doreen. Have we got anyone else further afield? Eden Park. Eden Park, a little further, yeah. I know Park. other side of the city, <laughs> Parkville. Yeah. No, fantastic. Um, before I get going, does anyone have a $10 note handy by any chance? And I promise I'll give it back. <laughs> You'll need it to buy one of the books. Yeah, magic tricks too. Magic tricks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's an old one too, good. Has anyone seen the new ones? The new, oh, the new currency. Very good. Yeah, I know, the little strange, isn't it? So, thanks Gab. Who, um, who knows who's on the $10 note? Do we know? Well, I can read it from Mike. Close, his counterpart. So you've got, the, the man is Banjo. Um, do we know who the lady is on the other side? Yes, that's right. The, the new one, thanks Gab. The new one um, is a little different. It also has her name, uh, which is nice because I think it's like the second, third and fourth verses of the National Anthem. We don't really know who they are or what they are. Yeah. The original one there, if you read it, if you've got it handy, has the words, never allow, or sorry, rather, it has the words, no foe shall gather our harvest or sit on our stockyard rail, next to Mary Gilmore's name. On the other side, it's got the man from Snowy River and a couple of things like that. But Mary Gilmore was quite an a influential uh, female poet, Australian poet. She was born in 1865. Uh, she lived to a venerable age of about 97. She wrote the poem, No Foe Shall Gather Our Harvest, which I've got a copy of it here. She also said the following words, never allow the thoughtless to declare that we have no tradition here. And that was in a poem that she wrote called The Ringer. When you read the poem that's referenced on the old $10 note. It goes a little bit like this. Sons of the mountains of Scotland, clansmen from Corrie and Kyle, breed of the moors of England, children of Erin's green isle. We stand four square to the tempest, whatever the battering hail, no foe shall gather our harvest or sit on our stockyard rail. She seems to have been a very defensive woman of her tradition and her country. And when I first read that line, never allow the thoughtless to declare that we have no tradition here, it really resonated with me because well, in my background, when I did VCE in high school, I was forced to study Australian history. And the reason I say forced is because I would have much preferred to have done the subject revolutions. Revolutions was Russian revolution, French, things I'd already studied. I was far more fascinated, it's strange now, but I was far more interested in studying the national stories of other nations than my own country, which is strange to me now. Uh, the reason I think that I didn't enjoy Australian history was less to do with the subject and more how the subject was taught. When I studied it, it was bland Vietnam moratorium, it was politics, and politics is fascinating, don't get me wrong, but we were taught to rote learn all of this content, and it wasn't as interesting as the em empires and the ancient narratives of other countries. Unfortunately, VCE me, like many, I think, of my peers, was conditioned to believe one very terrible lie, and that is that Australia has no history. Australia has no tradition. It's really great uh, to see a, a lot of the releases of Australian publishers, to have you all here this morning in fine company because it shows that we do have a history that people are eager to listen to. Um, and in what I do, I hope to address uh, a little bit of the history that's in our own backyard and show, of course, that we do have a very rich history, something that Mary Gilmore uh, was very proud of defending. What has caused, I think, a generation of people to believe that we've got very little history is, I think, a consequence of its youth, our country's youth. But as Dame Mary Gilmore said, that we resign our thought to say that there is no tradition in this great country. That is something I tried to capture a little bit in my novella. As Alison said, my name's Rob, and I was actually born in the Yarra Valley, raised in the Yarra Valley. I work as a real estate agent in King Lake. I trust you won't hold that against me. <laughs> I write every other hour of the day that I can find. Um, I think uh, for some it's, it's a hobby, which we would love to have been our, our full income, but we do what we can. Um, although I'm new to the field of Australian history, I have always loved history broadly, and that's something that I studied and and focused on studying. I was invited here by Liz, who's the local historian for YPRL. 
And uh, I was invited, I think, the introduction said that I am an aspiring local writer, which I've got a bit of an admission to make. Uh, when I started working in King Lake in November of 2015, I started working for my family's company. And I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with King Lake or if you've been to King Lake, but it's an area, it's a regional community, ultra local by spirit. And what I mean by that is there are people who've lived there for 40 and 50 years. They were born there, educated, had kids, married, they still live there. And they, they say, we're nearly a local. They're afraid to call themselves locals, which is an interesting thing. I was catching up with a friend of mine once um, who he has spent his whole life there and we were talking about what we want the area to become and he flippantly used the word local to refer to himself and this expression of grief darted across his face before he collected himself and said, oh, damn it, I am a local, I was born here. But he was so nervous about using the word and I think the reason for that is there is a lot of responsibility that comes with being a local in a regional community. You're not just a fly-by-night. There is a lot of responsibility associated with that title. For the people that live in King Lake, they're nearly a local because you're not a local unless you've lived there your whole life. I'll oddly enough return to this a little later, but I think that it's significant to regional communities, this exclusive local status. When I first began working there, I realised very quickly you don't have much clout if people consider you an outsider. So all of a sudden, although I grew up in Yarra Glen, I became very proud of my father building his first house in the King Lake Ranges. When I met someone in the street, all of a sudden I'd known them for their whole lives. Someone would say, oh, it's Buffalo Bill. I'd say, Buffalo Bill, we go way back. Um, and very quickly you get, you become known by how you act. I did do the book last year and so I was known around King Lake as the guy that wrote the book. So then June this year, I got an email from Liz inviting me as a local writer to come and speak. So it would seem that what began as being a local of Yarra Glen, I migrated to King Lake as a local now an honorary local of Whittlesea, and maybe I'll complete the round trip and become a local in Eltham before I go back to Yarra Glen. But the, the word, I think, is a lot broader than we give it credit. It's only recently that our communities have become centralised. Uh, traditionally, we here were a part of the county of Burke, county of Evelyn, county of Anglesey. We were all quite local. In fact, we all shared the same newspaper, the Evelyn Observer. Um, I, in this book, of course, I had a fantastic time discovering the histories of not only King Lake, but Whittlesea and all the, the corridor in between. And when I go into depth about the story, you'll realise how these people, though they live very far apart, consider themselves all neighbours. I'm not as much of a fraud as I might make out, uh, I promise you. And in the research of the book, I did do and burnt quite a lot of petrol. Um, in the morning, I would be at North Melbourne at the Public Records Office. Early afternoon, I was at Woodlands Historic Park in Tullamarine. By the evening, I was at Queenstown Cemetery in St Andrews. And so, in part, I consider myself to be a little bit of a local of each of these places because it's the history that we connect with that reaffirms, I think, our places in the communities in which we live. So, apart from my digression, I hope you accept me as an honorary local at Whittlesea. Thanks for all coming. It's my job, briefly, to tell you a little bit about not only my novella but the history of our backyard in this part of the world. Unfortunately, I've only got a little time, so I will have to be painfully concise. You probably tell already I was an art student. And, uh, of course, historically, I consider us all to be relatives and neighbours. The King Lake Ranges itself actually was called the Plenty Ranges originally. It had quite a close relationship with Whittlesea of Old, which was Plenty, the town of Plenty. But unfortunately, I've only a little time to speak of King Lake's history, and so I will try and keep as close to my story as I can. <coughs> Before I begin in earnest, if I haven't begun already. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about King Lake's background and if you take nothing else out of today, perhaps you'll remember this fact. Is there anyone who can tell me the reason for the name King Lake, where the name King Lake came from? Um, the the uh, writer, Alexander. Spot on, very good. Uh, wrote a book called The Open, but I read on your slide. The I think I might have given it away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful. I didn't know the reason you put up there was why. Very good. It, um, that's fantastic. I've I think. Got a copy of the book. Do you really? The There's a copy at the King Lake neighbourhood house yeah, as well. Right. But um, I would die to have a copy. That's fantastic. Yeah. And it, the interesting thing is, a lot of people, once they get past "Where's the lake?" question mark, they um, <laughs> they wonder. They wonder. That's exactly what. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Where's the lake? And then, pe pe 
locals have gotten to a point where they started to say, well, look, it's, um, when you do approach it, it tends to vanish in a mirage. <laughs> or the, the lake was another name for Yan Yin Reservoir or things like that. But um, even people that know that it was named after an influential barrister, historian and writer, Alexander William King Lake, um, they didn't know what the connection was. But in that time, the earliest name for King Lake was actually Stuart Mill. In the earliest survey map, which was in 1862, um, they gave it the name Stuart Mill, and this was when they were opening up the selections for settlers to farm. That was not named after a real mill. That was actually named after the philosopher John Stuart Mill. Now, when they came, they collected enough men and women to actually develop a township in the King Lake area. Stuart Mill was already taken. There was a township in northwestern Victoria called Stuart Mill. And so they, in vogue, it was uh, the manner to name it after influential writers associate yourself with their prestige and so they chose another man but also as you said his book Eothen was about his travels in the exotic east and even today a lot of King Lakers consider themselves living in the exotic east um, and so if nothing else you recall that and it's nice to see that the it's a lot more well known um, then you can answer people when they ask where's the lake. My rough uh, plan today is to begin a little bit by talking about the history of King Lake and then I'll talk a little bit about the research and lastly the method of writing when I did my novella. I'm sure I will miss things that perhaps you'll want to know a little bit more about if you want to know more of the writing or more about the research. Uh, but if I do, then I invite many, many questions if you've got them. What first caught my attention about this story, which you might have seen the fact pop up on the screen, this will keep through Rota um, telling you a little bit about unknown facts that you may not know about the King Lake Rangers. But if you haven't seen it already, uh, my story is about the first notorious murder that occurred in King Lake before it was King Lake. At that time, it was called the Mountain Rush. When I was just starting my job, I was in the King Lake post office and I came across this book. The queue was mighty long. I don't remember what letter I was posting, but um, I was dawdling around the store and I was flicking through this. And I came across a column which had titled Murder at the Mountain Rush. And I was smitten with the title. Uh, it wasn't just the alliteration, but the colours of the name, Murder, Mountain, Rush. It was fantastic. I delivered the letter, but I couldn't get over the story that I'd read, which was a story of a man named Edmund Cookson. He was a brewer from Queenstown who brewed beer for the miners that were living in St Andrews, the area of St Andrews. And on Friday the 23rd of May, 1862, he was collecting his payments and his debts in King Lake. Uh, he was last seen leaving the diggings around four o'clock in the afternoon on Friday and he never returned home. He took with him two dogs. Uh, he had two pet dogs. One of them returned home in the middle of the night, frightening his wife and his newborn son. The other was never seen again. This particular murder took quite a lot of time for the local population to get over. In fact, the location where it occurred is still called Cookson's Hill. You can see it in the newspapers if you trawl through Trove. It's um, recorded all across the country and in fact a manhunt commenced that extended all the way to Rockhampton in Queensland. When I started reading this story I couldn't get the characters out of my head and before long I was on Trove looking up the newspaper articles and it's really funny now to recall how little I knew then uh, versus of course 12 months on since the release of the book, it turned one a few days ago, um, how much I know now. But that's the thrill of learning, I think, is as some, someone once said, I can't recall their name, uh, the more I learn, the more I realise I do not know. And that's, I think, the thrill of learning is it suggests there's so much more that we're yet to discover. So, of course, Edmund Cookson, he was well liked by many. Uh, unfortunately, when he was found, he'd been shot through the neck but he'd been sitting at a stranger's campfire, which, smoking his pipe, his pipe was found broken beside him. Uh, and it implied that he'd sat beside this man's campfire for a yarn to share in the early evening with him, not knowing that this man was about to steal the cash and gold that he'd collected from the gold rush. Like I said, a manhunt did ensue, but as to whether or not uh, that rendered any results, you're just gonna have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> My story follows not Edmund Cookson in the first person. It follows a character by the name of Albert Nash, who was a real man. He was an Irish digger. And he was a man who, in my invention and creation, longed to escape the settled world. 
yet when Edmund Cookson is murdered, and it, it may seem strange that, uh, of course, we know the character that is to be murdered. That's not often the case with murder mysteries. But it's not the most important part of the story. When Edmund Cookson is murdered, all the walls of his isolation seem to fall down. The hands of the outside world, as I say in the blurb, begin to grasp at the mountain rush and Nash's separate lifestyle, this rambling gold miner lifestyle, begins to collide with all that he had hoped to escape. More broadly, the mountain rush as a place, and you can see some pretty s s fantastic historical photos, courtesy of the King Lake Historical Society. Oh, that's a great one as well. Um, Abel Hoadley owned property in the King Lake Ranges in the early 1900s. I've got a copy of the title actually here, I think. This is a very well-thumbed book. I think I've got a copy. Yeah, Abel Hoadley, if you want to pass that one around, who was the inventor of Violet Crumble, owned a fruit pulping factory in King Lake in the early 1900s. Um, and his factories were in St Kilda where he created Violet Crumble, but um, a little bit of claim to fame there. If I go off on tangents, please rope me in. Um, so the story of the Broader Mountain Rush was first visited by a storekeeper from Queenstown named David Moore, who was an Irish storekeeper, an ambitious man, who at this time in 1861, the gold diggings around St Andrews were waning. This was, of course, a few years after the Eureka Stockade. A lot of people's knowledge of the gold mining starts and ends in 1854. But in the 60s, it was still going. David Moore was an expeditious man who realised that the Diamond Creek, among other creeks, was flowing down from the hills, and he wondered what if there were gold in them hills. And so, him, among many other men and women, went into the King Lake Ranges in search of gold and began the new gold rush. Uh, they were men named Jack Grimshaw, who is, actually belongs to the famous Grimshaw family of Greensboro. Grimshaw Street is named after them. James Dickinson, Pat O'Brien, and many others. At that time, the Plenty Ranges was frontier land, Human hovel had come through in the 1820s, but upon climbing Mount Disappointment and being utterly disappointed, they uh, turned north and left the ranges behind. Later in that century, before the mountain rush gold diggers had ventured up to the area, there was a, a rush at Mount Disappointment, but all that they found were bloated rumours of gold and fool's gold and mica and nickel, but not the metal that they sought after. If only they had gone a little further east, they would have found the gold in the creeks. The indigenous peoples of the Tangarong especially were accustomed to the fertile lands around the King Parrot Creek, their hunting grounds, and there are stone scatters throughout the King Lake Ranges that imply their existence in the region, although they generally visited the bush quite fleetingly in transition between the Wurundjeri lands and their lands to the north. The hills were considered to be a border, liminal space. Outside of these people groups, no continuous community had existed in the King Lake Ranges until 1861, the discovery of gold and its roused about gold miners, and since it has not been shaken. Not long after 1861, uh, we have the development of deep shaft mining in Pheasant Creek, and before long, the area is crawling with miners, it's crawling with paling splitters, and a post office opens up. Now, the post office, of course, is the symbol of settlement, civilization in the world at that time. It's a testament to the permanency of men. However, the storekeepers at that time pleaded, due to the nature of their occupants, apparently single uh, mining men were not the most upstanding of citizens, they requested constant police presence. Now, the then police commissioner of the new Victoria Police, Frederick Standish, wrote a letter in May stating that he did not believe in the permanency of the township on the mountain rush. He believed these miners were proven to rush elsewhere and it did not warrant the expense of the government in establishing a police station. And only a few days later, Edmund Cookson was murdered at the Mountain Rush. And of course, there's police presence there now. It's only 156 years too late. Cookson's murder, I think, came at a curious time. It was only a few months later that the majority of the 800 population vanished and moved on to the Woods Point gold diggings. As we know, with gold rushes, they rushed to the next report of gold. It seems that Cookson's murder then was a form of a turning point. It came at a time where the post office closed, the population dropped, and people seemed to leave the hills behind. But there were little, there were inklings of survival. Men like Jack Grimshaw stayed until his death in 1918. There are characters, there are ghosts that you can read of in the newspapers who remained in this area their whole lives. And through their expeditious involvement, kept the community alive. It's not long after that we had the farmers come up to the King Lake Ranges and pioneer the, the country. Though it faded from time to time, this community survived. 
The story that I discovered launched me into an expedition of learning about this little known period, little known place that was compelling, not only because it was a murder mystery, but because for me, the, this was the first time that I was engaging with history on the very ground in which I stood. I'd always been fascinated, as I said earlier, by the empires, the rich narratives of ancient countries in Europe especially, but yet I'd never had a personal connection with these places. Now, I was reading about a tragedy and a, a narrative that had occurred right where I was standing and I could visit these places and I could visit where these people were buried and that made it real for me and made me fall in love with this nation's history like I should have when I studied it. I tried very hard in this novel to tease the historical characters as best I could, tease them out from the either. This is probably a good time to turn to the research. Um, one of my favourite historical fiction authors is a man by, by the name of Vernon Cornwall, writes a lot of um, Anglo-Saxon and, and French Revolutionary War um, novels. Um, and he said when asked, how much research is too much research? He said, you shouldn't ruin a good story by research. Research what is necessary and then that's it. And I'll, I'll have to disagree with Bernard, unfortunately, at least when I was writing this novel. The research for me was where it began and also where it ended. I could not stop researching any more than I could stop my writing. I had this niggling standard at that time that it was a crime to adulterate the facts. I think this was probably because I was enamoured with the discovery of a rich history in an area that I thought didn't have any. Australia didn't have history, how could King Lake? So I was aware, of course, not to spoil the mechanics of a good story, but yet I wanted to fit the facts as best I could. Sometimes you reshuffle events to flow better, but in writing Murder at the Mountain Rush, I took on a challenge to tell the story as truthfully as possible. There were little things that didn't change the experience of the reader an iota, and they were things that I laboured over. They were things like discovering the exact location that things occurred so I could visit there and write in situ. It was my highest priority. Like I said, these may not have altered the writing for the reader as much as it did for me, but I felt it gave me an authentic theatre to write in as well as doing a, a credit, I believe, to the people that I was writing about. As with other historical novels, I don't claim that I'm not depicting real people. In fact, I laboured to do them as much honour as I could. I wanted to draw close to these characters. They were characters that I read about in the newspapers of the time, and when I discovered their burial places in cemeteries like Queenstown and St Andrews, I was elated and overwhelmed with quite a solemn feeling to be reading the headstones of these people that I felt close to, although 150 years separate. Last year, as my first draft neared completion, so the end of May approached. Now, the end of May at that time was sacred to me. It was on the very night I was fortunate to walk in the same footsteps as Edmund Cookson had walked in, 156 years later, visiting the same place that he had his life taken from him. It's quite an eerie thing to do. And in that way, I subscribe to what I like to call method writing. It's almost like method acting. When I'm writing something like this, something especially historical, I honestly believe in osmosis, the effect that locations can have on us. It's, uh, in a way, a method of hunting ghosts. My rigour for strict accuracy in writing the novella meant I think good things for the tangibility of my characters. At the back of the book, there's a catalogue of photos of many of the places that I visited, cemeteries especially, that you can go to. And the idea with this book was it would be something palatable, takes a little, little under two hours to read, someone can take to the places that are mentioned and visit them and, and feel that they're connecting with the story on a physical level. I chart in this story as best I can the journeys and hardships that these people endured living on the extremity of a society. After all, it is an Australian tale and the best Australian stories, we mentioned Henry Lawson earlier, are stories of loss. It's not only a, about the loss of Edmund Cookson, that's quite timely, um, but what his death represents. I say at the back of the book in my historical note that this is the first step of the settled world laying claim to the mountain. And there is an idea still alive today in King Lake that a lot of people go there to run away from the world. They move further out, they move to the hills to escape something. It's still alive in many of the people that live there. So there's something jarring when it all finally catches up with you. For my narrator, Albert Nash, though little is understood about his past, it's evident that he cannot cope with settled life. When Cookson is killed, he is thrust into the suspicion of settlement and he struggles to manage his emotions. This is actually quite accurate to the time, uh, as the place where Cookson is 
was murdered, as I mentioned, is still known as Cookson Hill. And many people struggled with coming to grips of the, the first major event of crime in the area. Some may think that this process of osmosis doesn't make too much of a difference. They say just sit down and write the damn thing. But I think it does make a significant difference with the tangibility of the book. You become an authority on feeling when you visit these places. You gain intuition. And in many instances, I would make estimates in my writing which came true. As an example, Cookson's horse, when I first wrote the draft, was a bay horse. I simply chose a bay colour and thought nothing of it. But in later reading the reports of the lost horse, it was described indeed as a bay. Uh, there was a character, an indigenous character in the novel, who only after I had created his character did I read reports of a dark-skinned man on the diggings in King Lake, only after I'd created his character. These are things I think I owe largely to intuition and a thorough understanding of a place and a time through meditating in that place. I meditate a lot often when I'm writing this and, and other works and of course you draw glances from other people, they ask if I'm okay, if they don't get it, which they'd all just be quiet. But it's, uh, it's something that I don't think many of us do enough of going to these places and just spending time connecting with them. There are other parts of the story that I discovered in the course as well. These were things that I had to change, I had to alter. The senior constable, as an example, when I wrote the first draft, uh, was a bit of a pig. He embodied everything that was wrong with settlement. He was entitled, bigoted, he was judgmental, condescending, indifferent. And then I discovered in reading the newspapers that he was in fact Edmund Cookson's brother-in-law. So his character had to shift completely, but I think that that enriched the novel. In terms of the writing process itself, uh, I believe that is unique to the individual, actually. Um, as I've said, I personally thrive in method writing, and I think that's probably just because I get my kicks out of visiting the real world places that these stories have happened. And in that way, I like to place myself in the location, in the mood. Recently, I traveled to Tasmania. Um, we're currently writing a, a book which is set in convict Tasmania. So I traveled to Strawn on Macquarie Harbour to visit the places um, where these specific events happened to feel some connection with them, although it's been nearly 200 years since. Many professors, and I took a subject at, at university, which was a creative writing subject, and I only took it for one semester. Um, many professors tell you, write what you know. There's this idea that you can't have any authority on things that you don't experience firsthand. However, I think that that should be elaborated rather to say, write what you can know or that you could know. It's the practice of empathy in writing. Empathy is the difference between good writing and bad writing, and you better believe there's a distinction. Although I did not live through the death of Edmund Cookson, nor did I pan for gold on the mountain rush, there are practices that I can put in place that allow me to develop empathy with the characters that did. And in this way, I attempt osmosis, gain insight into how they lived, and I think that that is the most important thing about the study of history, empathy because it teaches us not only to empathise with those that have long since passed, but with our fellow creatures around us. I think it's the most thrilling thing that we can do, which is why, personally, I tend towards historical fiction as a genre. It's exploring places, how they've changed and changed the people with them. In Australia, it's quite fascinating. We're a striking example of a young country. Uh, there's a number of scholars. Dean Jeans was one who said, Australia's late settlement saw the full power of the industrial revolution, lacking any sense of ecology, be brought to bear upon the land. Another, Tom Griffiths says, Australia, unlike most parts of the New World, experienced the colonisation with industrialisation almost coincidentally. He calls it a double revolution. It seems that the pace at which Australia transformed from a seeming natural idol, manipulated by the First Peoples through fire, among other methods, and then into a sweeping binary of industrial and pastoral communities and thence into the modern age in which we're living is understated. Too many people, I think, draw attention to the effects of colonisation without referring to it by its proper name, Australian colonisation. It is a unique case. As an example, when you think of America, from uh, Columbus's voyage as a date, 1492, there is more time that passed between the first entry of Columbus and his, and his lackeys into the Americas to the election of George Washington than has passed from George Washington to our present day. Which means that people had an experience in the Americas different to the entire length of the American nation state. On our side of things, 
a mere 113 years has separated the development of Britain's secondary jail to our federation as a commonwealth. And since it's only been about 116. It's no trifling fact that there's been a little over a century on either side of that. The enormity of our changes is framed by the short space of time in which we've had those changes occur upon our first peoples, upon our landscape, and upon those volumes that have come to call this country home. In this way, our national story is quite unique, as every national story is unique. But I think that the pace at which we undergo change as a country, not necessarily embrace it or even fight against it, but just bear it, is significant to our national character. Because undergoing change, of course, evokes a feeling of loss, and loss is central to some of our most precious national stories. It is a mere fragment of our national story, which I try to uncover in Murder at the Mountain Rush and explore in the book. The one thing that fascinated me most in my journey was not only how Victoria, but the King Lake Ranges as a case study represented on a small scale what happened in our country on a large scale. What I mean by this is all that has happened in Victoria has happened in King Lake. From a long and proud Indigenous history to the entry of the pastoralists into Port Phillip, the opening of the massive sheep runs, there was a, quite a large sheep station in Mount Disappointment. The establishment of satellite towns on the frontier happened at Eltham. The opening of the gold rushes significantly understated in the mountain rush. And then, of course, the pioneering selectors in their farming, which is a massive feature of King Lake's history. The effects of 20th century wars is registered in no small part by the King Lake community. And the list burgeons. There is so much that has happened in large scale, which happens in the everyday lives of our people. And in the field of history, which uh, is becoming a lot more um, well known, it's less and less the stories of heroes, but the tales of common people that tell our histories. And I think that it's fantastic that it's taking that shift. In the manner of writing stories, uh, hopefully I can return to where I began. Uh, although I focus much on King Lake, Whittlesea, like other towns, is a town on the fringe. It's not much different in that way. In fact, in my field, I'd speak to quite a lot of people who remember Doreen Mernder from about 10 years ago and how it has changed since. Um, Whittlesea being a town on the fringe, many here may remember Upper Plenty, uh, the town of old, even those who worked the Scrubby Creek diggings in the 1860s. There's an incredible pace of development, especially here. This is why towns on the fringe, I think, value their history and treat with reverence what it is to be local. This is why it's vehemently protected, why true locals are even nervous to call themselves locals. Because living where we live, be it Yarra Glen or Whittlesea or King Lake, it comes with a responsibility, a pact. We may not be aware of it, in that case we shoulder it unwittingly, but it is a pact to the past and the future. Whilst other places are whitewashed and renegotiated, reinvented and made of plastic and given names like Parkview and these kinds of names, we have a history I think that people envy. We are the frontier out here. As we face the frightening pace of development, our history becomes a lot more relevant, a lot more precious, and more often than not, we are called to repeat Mary Gilmore's words, never allow the thoughtless to declare that we have no tradition here. And for that, for its preciousness to us, it ought to be protected. And the best way that we protect our history is by telling its stories, which is something that I have tried to do and hope to continue to do, and hope that if you all are interested in the process as well, you do yourselves. Uh, I hope, of course, that I've addressed as much as I can without missing too much. And if I've missed something, I'm sure you'll ask me a question about it. In fact, I invite you to ask a question about it. But thanks so, so much for your attention, of course. I hope I didn't run too far over. I do hope you learned something about our area, a humble area up on the hills. And if you've got any questions, um, I'm uh, at your disposal. Thank you so much for coming today. You've been a fantastic audience. Thank you. My pleasure, absolute pleasure. Is there anything that I missed? Go for it. About the rugby writing process, yes. do you, are you lucky enough, as, as I am, to have um, a, a group of uh, fellow writers or friends that can give you feedback and critique work and things like that? And how do you, how do you work on that process with yep. other people? I am actually very fortunate enough. Um, briefly, can we all give Andy a quick hand? Thank you very much for Andy. <laughs> Pulled himself out of bed and came over here to support me. Andy actually runs a group just like that over in Muralbark. And that's a group of people who get together every week on a Tuesday night. And more often than not, we really just talk about trivial things. But 
we do a lot of draft reading, bouncing ideas, and the bouncing ideas is the big one. I think writers by nature are pretty solitary creatures, and kind of what we do is write on our own in our four walls, um, and like to pretend that there's no world outside of what we're creating. But I think you forget the value, like you were saying, of bouncing ideas and having others to read what you write, because when you write something, it's a, an old rule, you'll always miss something that someone else will pick up. And so I think that, um, although for a long time I liked writing because it was just me, it was a one-man show, um, I think it's valuable to have insightful friends and family who will tell you not necessarily what you want to hear, but critique your work, which is very important. So I think it's important to have a, a couple of different people who read differently, read different things, to be able to you know, read your drafts, but it, also when you're writing a new project, to just be able to converse with them and, and listen, because sometimes you just need to talk something out before you, you know, get to where you're going. So yeah, I, I think a support network is very important. And then we just hide again, go into our cave and then we come out, <laughs> then we go back into the cave. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. The whiteboard. Oh. Yep, yep. <laughs> Becomes a coloured board. I joined the writers group a couple of years ago when I started writing and I, I didn't go for very long because I found we were given homework and I just wanted to work on yeah. my own stuff. Yeah. And you know, you'd, you'd read out your, your 500 words on whatever topic and you go around the table and people say, oh, that's lovely, thank you for that. Yeah. So that's not making you a better writer. See, that's why I, I did... That's word. exactly, yeah. That, that's the cause for a short-lived creative writing subject that you do in undergraduate <laughs> university. Because you go in and it's, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Especially surrounded by other art students. Because everyone's, everyone's, oh, isn't that great? Yeah. That's it awesome. Make you any better. So yeah. yeah. And you can't, yeah, yeah, exactly. There is, there, it's a very delicate thing to critique yeah. writing. You can't really study it objectively. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's important to surround yourself with, I think, like-minded people yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Any questions about the history at all? Uh, not so much the history, um, the locations that you've mentioned. Yes. Cookson's Hill. Uh, where exactly is that? Are you familiar with the King Lake Heidelberg Road? Yes, very. The <laughs> notorious windy road. Yeah. yeah. Constant <laughs> battle between yeah. cyclists and motorists. <laughs> yes. The Heidelberg. I know, Gab, you're Luckily familiar. Going home and home. Yeah, that, that's it. So a lot of the perils, um, the the peril of tourists. Google Maps will take them up the King Lake Heidelberg yeah. Road. They'll go. Uh, where are we from? Uh, we're from, you know, um, Fitz. Yeah, right. Just don't run. Um, yeah, so actually at the top of the King Lake Heidelberg Road, because that road was cut in in the 1880s. Before then, it was a bridle track. So after the. the yes, uh, so originally, uh, of course, we had the town of St Andrews, was first known as Queenstown. Interesting background about the name St Andrews is kind of the colloquial name, because a lot of people were Scots. That's why it was called the Caledonia Diggings. Mm. And of course, St. Andrew, the patron saint of the Scots. Uh, St. Andrew's Church was the first church in, in St. Andrew's or Queenstown. But the, the gold diggings was happening there at Smith's Gully and on the Diamond Creek, which was originally known as Back Creek. And of course, that creek flows directly out of a gully between what's called Mount, uh, Mount Beggary and, um, and Gangaloff Hill, which is on the, the King Lake side of things. So the old track was straight up that hill which is why the road is so terrible to drive, because it's a very old road. Road. Yeah, a little bit. So between Boltspur Road and Heidelberg King Lake Road, that was the main access. Mm. Now, the Heidelberg King Lake Road, uh, people kind of went through that valley there, which is called Nynx Road. Um, of course, the roads change, and this is the hard thing about sleuthing through history, everything changes, especially in our area where we've got the peril of bushfire, because mm. it completely changes. And my brother, when I was writing this book, and looking for the site of the, the murder, he said this funny thing, he goes, there's nothing of 150 years here today. There's nothing. It's completely altered, which it is. Um, and so the spot is actually at the top of the hill. If you're driving through that road, keep an eye out for a sign that says Mountain Rush Juncture. And there is a, a green national park sign called Cookson Hill Track. So if you're driving from, let's say, Eltham or St. Andrews towards King Lake and you go up the King Lake Heidelberg Road, you come to this kind of plateau, it's the saddle, mm -hmm. where Old King Lake Road runs, the Heidelberg King Lake Road, there's a walking track up the hill, and then there's Cookson Hill track. And that was the spot where all the walking tracks collided and span off in different directions. And that was a place of, it was called the Old Hut, and there was an old hut there. No statement of who built this hut, how, old it had, how long it had been around, but that was where this guy was camping, the mysterious person who murdered Edmund Cookson. And so the spot is, on that saddle, 
if you search King Lake Heidelberg Road and drive up to the top nice and slowly, it's a windy road, you'll see a sign that says Mountain Rush Juncture and you can take the walking track. That's the location where the old hut was because that was the old access track going to the diggings on the number two creek in King Lake. Um, but the King Lake's a really interesting case because you had the King Lake side of things, which was quite separate from the King Lake West side of things, which the communities themselves are still quite separate today because it's 14 kilometres of one township. So it's a very long township. Um, and so you had a lot of influence coming from Whittlesey, the Whittlesey side of things. And then you had a bit of influence coming from the east. Um, so it's, it, it's yeah, quite, a, quite an interesting thing to study in terms of a 14 kilometre long township. But yeah, that's the spot, which is actually, I do have a map in the front of the book with roughly corresponding to, to the roads as well. Yes? I'd like to know about the narrative for the next book. The next one? Yeah, I'll let you know I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> the, um, the idea with uh, these books, um, Murder at the Mountain Rush, was the start of exploring King Lake's history especially, but the broader area. And I was going to write a couple of others. There was one about the internment camp in King Lake West during World War II where in, in unfriendly aliens, as they were called, were interned, Germans and Italians. And there are many other stories about the gold rush times, but unfortunately that project has taken a bit of a back burner at the moment. Um, and I'm currently working on a, a, a novel length. Um, and that's a story called In the Company of Madness. And it's about a notorious convict whom you may be familiar with, Alexander Pierce, who's a very notorious convict, um, notorious by way of his cannibalism. Uh, that's a cracking story um, and a bit of a jump from this one. Um, but what I do there is, and recently I've been studying quite a lot about the convict society of Tasmania, which is a very interesting thing to study because Tasmania was our breadbasket for so long. Uh, while New South Wales was in famine, Tasmania was feeding it. But then the modernisation of our country left Van Diemen's Land behind in a way. So it's very interesting because history can break just like that. So that will be the next book. It's uh, in the throes of draft three at the moment. So it's, yeah, it's... Um, on, on the Tasmanian. In a way, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's Willow's next king. <laughs> yeah, very good. The whole lot of it. When we first saw um, where we eventually yep. bought it, King Lake, I liked it because it was like Tassie. Oh, fantastic. Whereabouts was that? Uh, in... Um, uh, it, it was actually the Baylisses' land when they, they sold that. Yeah, um, fantastic. Uh, off um, um, Currajong Avenue. Yeah, very good. Avenue. Yep. So I'm going quite, quite good friends with... Uh, new road for yeah, years, yeah, that's you know? it. Um, I'm quite close with Owen and Jane. Okay, um, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I didn't tell you, got Jane yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah and it, it's, a, it's amazing. The, and when I was at Mill Park Library um, earlier in the year, um, when people, of course, come through the... Uh, and they see the book about King Lake, they think, King Lake history? Uh, and, and they ask a lot of questions, and you, you realise pretty quickly that like pollen in the wind, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people that have lived in that area especially spread out, but always kind of, yeah, it it's, keeps a real special place in, in our hearts. I suppose that's where home for anyone does that. Mm. But I was, even when I was in Tassie not long ago, I was doing a Gordon River cruise, oh, and... Beautiful. It is. Yeah, it's a wonderful place in, in the world. But I was on the ship and who did I run into? A family that used to live in King Lake. So we started talking about King Lake. So King Lake history is a bit of a jealous history. It doesn't leave you alone. Pretty much. That's right. Uh, hilarious. I, yeah, I, oh, it's incredible. I, um, the archives in Taz are incredible. I haven't had a chance to delve enough into them, but, um, at my disposal to do, do that because it's the same thing with Mitchell Library as well. They've kept some incredible stuff. Yeah. Fortunately, I think we're, we're lucky in uh, the National Library here because we've got the online resources. A lot of it's been digitised, yeah. mm -hmm. which means you can access anything. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I've looked up my convict ancestors. Very good. Um, um, records and found out when they got into trouble and when they... Um, came yeah. so How many pairs of actually, shoes they stole? It's actually a, a, a vellum book. Yeah, really. Online. And you've seen, and, and yeah. And you can sort of hit a, you know, a symbol at the top of the page. Yeah. The page turns over. Oh, From, it's, it's incredible. Beautiful copper plate writing yeah. on the page. And it's incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. But no, no, Ta Tasmania's got a, a, a fascinating history that, again, um, I think is a little bit understated. Um, the, it, it's, I remember when I was at the Hobart airport once, 
I just come from Port Arthur and I bought a little pewter model of the church, the Gothic church down there, the Anglican church. Um, and of course I got hauled over because it's this sharp pointy thing, metal thing, and they asked me what I was doing with it. But because um, we're in, in Hobart, the guy said, oh, I said, it's oh, a pewter model of the church at Port Arthur. And he went, oh, yeah, no, nah, no worries, mate. My, uh, my ancestors were a convict as well, got <laughs> hauled out here for stealing a bag of flour. And people, it's the shift. I was speaking to a lady also who works at the Tench, the old Hobart, the jail, um, who was saying about how not too long ago, it was a token of shame in a way that statewide people didn't want to talk about it. I only found out 20 years ago. Yeah. It was swept under the carpet and it's shifted now. It's done a complete 360. Now it's, it's you know, people go there and they're fascinated by the history. And you ask the question, how, how does that happen? Why, why does that happen? Um, and it's really interesting to me to study the convict history a lot broader than um, just a, a jail full of prisoners. Uh, there's a great book called Van Diemen's Land by a man named James Boyce, um, who I quoted in when I was speaking. And in his book, he goes into depth. His thesis is along the lines of, People have too long been looking at convict Australia as through the, the vessel of a prisoner, whereas you need to consider that the convict was just the lay person. That what we had was a, a workforce who were, yes, they were punished for, exactly, it was cheap labour. And you look at any, any nation was essentially built on a form of slave labour. A lot of people forget the, the, we had a lot of European slave labour here, which itself is probably a controversial phrase to, to utter, but it, it is true. And you think of Tasmania especially, there's some freaky statistic about the majority of people that were living there were from convict stock. And so you can't look at them as, as an anomaly. They're not just prisoners. That's the population. So it's, it's really interesting to go back in our history. And although people flippantly love to mention, um, yeah, we come from a convict who stole six eggs or something like that. Um, the context itself is completely different and a lot more um, a lot more severe and serious than just you know, a dozen eggs or a pair of shoes or a bag of flour. My um, great-great-grandfather, my, my Tasmanian mm. connection, my great-great-grandfather was not a convict, but he came out in the 1830s with his wife. His wife's brother was a convict who was transported out. Yeah, right. And that's why I did all this research. Yep. And he was, an, a quote, an innkeeper in Hobart Town at that time. Wow. And there are references in Trove to him being fined for allowing convicts in to tipple on a Sunday. <laughs> So there's all of those sorts of, you know, that's the other yeah, side of the yeah. coin. He, when in, during the, um, uh, there was a, a census and, you know, and how many free people and how many, you know, convict people. Mm. Obviously, he had convicts working for yeah. him. In, it's called the York Hotel. It's no longer there. But uh, there's a lot of references uh, through Trove. Yeah. Mm. That's a great resource so to use. Of, yep. It's in the, her first book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> um, yeah, so I, told, I thought that was fascinating. So yep. I, I told a, a sort of a narrative around that particular setting in my writing. But it's just fascinating, as you said, that link to stand in a place or yep. be in a place where you think, this, you know... I think, it's making a, I think it's making a comeback. I think historical fiction is making oh, a com yeah. comeback because we're all very aware of mm. our past yeah. and yeah, especially with the pace of change that we're undergoing. You, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a massive market. Mm. Yeah, very good. On the other side of the town of the convicts in Tasmania. Oh, it was a pretty Australia generally has a really diverse history from state to state. That every every area has its own really unique story. From Victoria, having very little convict association whatsoever. Um, of course, Tasmania and New South Wales. It's just it's fascinating, and in such a short space of time. Yeah, that's right. Um, Sorry. And, yeah, Batman. Yeah. They came across in the mobile. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it's, it, it's fascinating. Um, is there anything else that I failed to address? Fantastic. I really like the way that you go into the, the actual place where things happen yeah. and just let, let the, the yeah. kind of soak, soak yeah. into yeah. it. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Which the, there, are, there are photos in the book. Um, which hopefully I'm not sure if many have been to a place like Queenstown Cemetery or, um, or Woodlands Historic Park near Tullamarine. There are these places which are kind of being encroached on by you know, our, growing, our growing settlement um, and they're, they're not very well protected. And you go to Queenstown, it's incredible. It's this beautiful old rust, rusting cemetery, um, 150 years old, just, just sitting there. I think teenagers go there to drink and that's, that's kind of... That's it. But yeah, it's, um, hopefully you can you know, seek out the places and yeah, go there and experience it for yourself because it's pretty fa fantastic. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it.